is this? I don't know. It's me. It's Amid the Ruins. It's a guy who makes dire wave music. <laughs> it's Amid the Ruins. Dire wave, dire music. wave music. What I've talked about in you know probably a hundred articles of Jay's analysis is the implementation of the AI smart grid and the giant smart cities, which is what IBM talks about publicly building. And that's where we're going, and that's what I think we have to be really concerned about. So all of these tensions, they are part of a long-term strategy to basically get everybody moved into mega cities. Uh, they'll be forced to, they'll be forced off of land and so forth for environmental reasons, and basically concocted and invented environmental nonsense. Uh, then you'll be stuck in some hellhole mega city in a, you know, basically a carton-sized apartment living over a Target or something, or inside of a Target or a Walmart, as I said <laughs> several years ago. It's actually coming true now. There's actually Target cities. This is all part of the long-term globalist strategy. So, but to get there, you've got to have the constant clash, the constant um, alchemical blending and mixing and smashing together right out of Manichaeanism to produce the convergence, to produce the synthesis. And that's what's crucial in all this and what is absolutely true from an alchemical, esoteric, philosophical, and geopolitical perspective, the fact the ruling elite seek to be post-human. Jaysanalysis.com can't try to 
fix today's problems politically. And this is what so many people in alt circles and alt right and alt whatever and alt media, they all seem to think that there's like a political solution to man's problems. And really the, the, the whole of modernity is built on this neo-pagan concept of political salvation. And there is no political salvation for man because man's problems are not essentially Hey, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Hey, how you doing out there? Tony. Yeah, come here, Christopher. What's up? How y'all doing tonight? I know that uh, you probably expected I would be doing a theology stream, um, given some of the recent... Uh, nonsense from Matt Fried, but that's okay. I was really more so in the mood to do uh, the part two of the Mafia stream. We were, we were either going to do the next, because I did the subscribers, right? The subscribers half. And there was a lot of juicy details for the subs, if you missed it. And uh, thank you. One of those juicy details, by the way, was that we did dig up the uh, Masonic element to Giuseppe Garibaldi, right? And the history of where the Masonic elements of the Mafia initiation come from. And then uh, we also got into the intelligence angle with Sam Giancana, Momo, right? The successor to Al Capone, who was the head of the Chicago outfit, was recruited by the uh, CIA. So that's just a little couple tidbits of the information that we did dig up uh, in scholarly sources for the part two. So if you missed that, definitely go subscribe and get access to the part two. But today, it's a little hot in here. A little hot in the Macala. I got a little bit of gabagool stuffed under this. Under the sweat, I got uh, some Mormon underwears underneath uh, this. With uh, the Mormon underwears themselves is stuffed full of the gabagool. Because it feels good on my skin. It's nice and cool on the skin. <laughs> We're going to be talking about Carlo Gambino. One of the premier dons of the heyday of the Mafia will become the most powerful, influential man in New York for many years. And he was the granddaddy. He was the unassuming little... Oh, yeah, Carlo Gambino, I'm just a, I'm just a little grandpappy. I'm your little pappy. <laughs> and he really was this little humble, little unassuming figure. But he was actually the uh, kingpin. He was the head. A fascinating figure. And he will uh, be the father, the Don of, obviously, the Gambino family. So we're going to talk about that, the wartime stuff again. We're going to talk about Vegas, the idea, Bugsy's idea. Bugsy says to Meyer Lansky, I got this idea for an oasis in the desert where we don't have to illegally get, gamble at the Crashino. The crashinos, to use Dr. Brule's phrase. We'll just make it legal, dude. What are we doing? Make it legal in one place. Buy the politicians off, right? Godfather 2. And get it legal. We'll make bank, dude. And Meyer and Bugsy come up with this. Meyer says, yes, this is a good idea. Let me talk to some people. Meyer was, of course, the consultant to the five families. And as you know, probably, this leads to the Flamenco, right? And millions and millions of dollars keep getting sunk into the Flamenco, and nobody is seeing their returns, right? So a lot of money, a lot of union pensions, a lot of, a lot of mobster money is going into this, and they're saying, hey, Bugsy, where's the returns? We're not seeing any. We're just having to sink more and more in, right? This was originally a $1 million investment. Now it's turned into three, five million. Where is it? And as you know, 
uh, Virginia Woolf, Bugsy's girlfriend, and Bugsy seemed to make off with some of this money, and this leads to the end of Bugsy. Right? There goes Bugsy. And by the way, the movie is pretty good. Uh, I didn't actually expect Bugsy to be that good. It was actually really good. So uh, we, I definitely recommend the Warren Beatty Bugsy. It's a really good movie. And uh, upon reviewing a lot of these mafia films for the show that I decided to postpone to tomorrow's uh, with Jamie, um, I didn't enjoy The Departed as much as I expected. In fact, I really like Casino better. Uh, Casino was great. And upon review, it's kind of, it's moving up there uh, in, you know, towards the top of favorites. Um Bugsy was really good. Cotton Club, nah, not so much. It's like half a Cotton Club is just tap dancing. I don't care about tap dancing. And I know half of my audience are devoted tap dancers, but guys, I don't care about tap dancing. And to to put half of my movie, half of my mafia movie experience to be a bunch of fucking tap dancers, get the Got it. I don't want to give me none of that. Give me none of that tap dancing. I'll show you the only kind of tap dancing I go for is red tat 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 tap dancing. That kind of tap 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 dancing. That's what I like right there, you see. Anyway, it is kind of a musical and uh, uh, boring. Uh, I did like the element of uh, Oni Madden. Right, played by Bob, Bob Hoskins, who, of course, is a well-known Hot Springs gangster that we touched on in part two. Uh, but it didn't have enough cage, right? We got, like, a couple minutes of, of Crage in this movie. Uh, come on. I expect more from my mom. If you're going to put Nick Cage in a Mafia movie, I want to see Nick go Crage and rat tap 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 dance on somebody with his... Tommy Gun, this is my Tommy Gun. I have a little friend I want you to to come to know. My friend named Tommy, right? And uh, Richard Gere, boring, wooden, in Cotton Club. Not a likable. I don't know what he is. Performer, actor. He's supposed to be playing the character George Raft. Uh, I think it was a mobster who hung out with. Um, Oni Madden and Dutch Schultz. Now, the Dutch Schultz angle is pretty good in Cotton Club. Anyway, we'll get to Cotton Club. We can do all that. But let's uh, get back to this. We're going to talk about Carlo. Now, uh, in the early phases when the Sicilian Mafia made their way over to the U.S., uh, there were different uh, small-time factions. One of those was the Maranzano faction. And again, this was the bootlegging period. And uh, they were close to Albert Anastasia. And Carlo uh, got in on this, and he became a uh, World War II profiteer uh, in this phase of the black markets. So, as we said, the uh, focus of the government during World War II was on wartime stuff. They didn't really have a whole lot of time, energy, and effort to expend on prosecuting organized crime. So this allowed the... Uh, the mafia to make a lot when it came to the black markets, especially the bootlegging. And uh, Carlo got in on this racket of stealing stamps. So there were the, there were rationing stamps that existed back at this time, where the government would ration your food stamps and all kinds of stuff like this, so you could you had all these limitations on what you could buy, right? And uh, Carlo figured out a way to. Uh, steal stamps directly from the OPA, whatever the government office that printed out them food stamps, my EBT, my EBT. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for supporting with those super chats. You come here to learn, baby. I'll do your homework for you. This is my racket. Yeah, she, I control the homework racket, she. <laughs> yeah, she, I control the multiple choice racket, you see. One dollar. Come on now. Come on now. One dollar. I'm not going to do your homework for $1. I'm 
bro. Now, Carlo decides that um, this is all going well, but we got to expand. Okay, we got to keep expanding. International Longshoresmen Association. This is some international group that is a front that's connected to Carlo. Uh, now, Carlo is rising in the ranks, but Lucky is still running stuff. Okay, so this is prior to Carlo becoming the most powerful man, or still the early phases. Um, now, this is where we get an interesting connection between a figure named Hogan. And Hogan is working with the Navy, and the Navy calls upon the aid of Meyer Lansky, and, uh, at, which, who was an OSS ally, and the CIA calls upon, and then eventually the CIA also calls upon the aid of Lucky Luciano. So the Navy, the OSS, the CIA will all have direct connections to the Mafia, and you can imagine why, because as we all know, the OSS took over many of the drug pipelines, right, the drug lanes, and who was directly connected to the drug lanes? Well, of course, the Sicilian Mafia. Um, and we're going to see that as a repeated pattern also with Vito Genovese, right? Vito also works with the Navy, U.S. Navy. Um, the reason that the Navy wanted the, the aid in the U.S. of uh, Carlo and Lucky was because of the control, again, of the Union and Dock Harbor Freight Logistics, right? So they knew everything about the docks. They knew they controlled the harbors. And what was coming in and out, obviously that's a very important for the drug trade. Uh, and it's also important, again, for politics and so forth. And so the Navy requests the aid for the, uh, of the Sicilian Mafia in um, spying and watching and, and keeping track on the ports, what's coming in and out, spies, and also in Italy, right? Uh, watching and, and controlling and looking at the ports in Italy because, right, Italy becomes an Axis power. Uh, the, they were worried about Mussolini finding out about the aid that they gave to U.S. naval intelligence. So a lot of the Sicilian mafia, as we said earlier, were uh, concerned. Now, somebody was trying to argue with me in the comments on the previous video. Uh, one of the sources, histori historical sources, did say that Mussolini gave a some kind of special award or recognition to uh either Vito or Carlo. I don't remember. So that's what I meant by love-hate relationship. I know that on the whole, uh, Mussolini was anti-mafia, uh, and this is precisely why, because the uh, Western intelligence and military apparatus was calling upon the aid of the Sicilian mafia. And this is during the period when uh, we saw earlier that ta Senator or the politician Thomas Dewey right was going after the mobsters and so Dewey uh, goes after Lucky Luciano and this leads to him being banished to Italy so Lucky goes into exile goes back to Sicily and he's shipped back to his little village but when he gets back he receives a hero's welcome because Lucky is considered a war hero so uh, he's not considered a criminal when he goes back home. Now, another one of the figures that was also aiding the West was Vito Genovese, as we said, Don of the Genovese crime family. Um, and Vito made bank by selling products to both sides uh, in World War II. And so it was Vito that was uh, playing both sides and I think was awarded by Mussolini. And he would he would... Uh, cheer on from Naples, Il Duce, and at the same time would also supply information and sell drugs, I guess, to soldiers and uh, really did play both sides here. Now, Vito, though, on the lowdown was actually a secret uh, fascist, supposedly. So he was secretly a supporter of, Fas of Mussolini, even though he... Um, was uh, aiding both sides. And Vito uh, had guys that would kill any of the anti-fascist uh, characters in Italy. 
And this is presumably why Mussolini liked him. But he did this at the same time <laughs> as he was advising the U.S. military. Uh, now, this became a bit of a uh, problem. And so suddenly, wouldn't you know, he has a conversion against fascism. So he leaves fascism to become a U.S. military advisor. And now he uh, is Don Vito, protected by and working with U.S. military naval intelligence. Wow. What do you know? Now, keep this in mind. This will be a repeated pattern. Over and over and over, we'll see intelligence calling upon the mafia for aid, for help, for assistance. And keep that in mind. In the next series that we'll be doing concurrent with this, you're going to notice a lot of overlap with the organized crime world and the serial killer world. All right, so what are we going to see? Again, going deeper into the, the, the research that Dave McGowan laid out. Uh, that Tom O'Neill has laid out, that uh, Maury Terry has laid out, many writers in, in true crime have pointed out of this uh, uh, connection between these different worlds of, as we saw, obviously, with esoteric Hollywood, cults in Hollywood. Now we're going to expand into this you know, intelligence apparatus in Hollywood. Now we're moving into organized crime and serial killers and intelligence. And you'll see that this is a world that very much overlaps and in fact the serial killers will have a direct connection to uh, organized crime because many of the serial killers it seems like are probably parts of contract killings so serial killers will, will tie into murder inc albert anastasia not all of them and not saying i know definitively in every case but there does seem to be some clear connections here and at the same time, there will be uh, clear parallels between the serial killers and their military training. Uh, so I have, again, done uh, extensive research the last week, last, the last two weeks, uh, going into the serial killers and their uh, military training and CIA connections and MKUltra connections. More than uh, I knew a couple years ago, right? So we're going beyond just Dave's book, uh, looking into some other work. But let's get back to uh, Don Vito. Now, Don Vito, head of the Genovese, as we said, he's going to be working with U.S. Naval Intelligence and uh, sets himself up in a big estate and ends up arrested in 1944 by intelligence agents. Uh, he eventually, of course, gets free. They always get free because of being connected, probably. And uh, ends up going to Jersey. So this is where Vito Genovese ends up in Jersey. And this will, again, loosely uh, lead us to the some of the mythology in The Sopranos, right? Because... Uh, Tony right represents the Jersey faction, New Jersey faction. Anyway, so next we're going to look at Vegas and the legalization of gambling. And by the way, uh, please, if you would, uh, support through the super chats. If anybody has any questions, I mean, don't you guys find America's history fascinating? Don't you want to know? how the world really works and the connection between the intelligence agencies and the mafia and Hollywood cults, mind control. I mean, that's, that's what we specialize in here. And by the way, you know, there's a lot of skeptics out there. A lot of people who have, you know, no knowledge of any of this, a lot of ignorant people, even though it's in your face every day in the news in history in Hollywood and movies, documentaries. Um, I mean, these are mainline books I'm going from these. I'm not, none of this is coming from conspiracy texts. Okay. Selwyn Robb's Five Families book is a mainline eight, 900 page book on the history of the mafia. Uh, in the 1940s, there were a few small casinos in Vegas, probably run by what? In, in the Native Americans, right? And as we said, Bugsy and Meyer get the idea to team up and turn this into an oasis, an oasis in the desert, a, a fantasy 
The plane, the plane, <laughs> pass. Fantasy Island in the desert. Uh, Bugsy had previously been involved in operations as a hitman. Um, and Bugsy was tasked with representing the five families in Los Angeles. Right. And by the way, if you watch the movie, that's all in the movie too. So now when he gets out there, here we begin to have a pretty strong direct connection to uh, Hollywood. Now we saw that with Momo, right? The Chicago outfit had a, a tendency to manipulate Hollywood as well. And that was in part two of last time's lecture. I'm not going to go into all that. But um, Bugsy ends up running around with George Raft, the actor. And if you watch The Cotton Club, it, it seems like the movie uh richard gear is playing the the uh, character reminiscent of george raft right who was a 30s actor who would play gangsters and so he becomes the basis the basis for dixie dixie dwyer and uh cotton club now um what's interesting about this is that uh bugsy was so popular in los angeles uh, representing the five families out there that he almost went into movies himself. <laughs> he actually auditioned for a couple and uh, had some decent screen tests, although he never did get the role. People thought that he would end up in the movies. But uh, if you watch the movie, the Bugsy Siegel with, with uh, I just went blank, Madonna's husband, Warren Beatty. <laughs> The uh, movie is pretty true to form, um, and though thus, as we said, uh, Meyer helped him set up the flamenco, and it ended up losing millions of dollars, and this ends up in him being gunned down for the missing one to three million dollars. <laughs> it would seem that his Virgin his girlfriend Virginia uh, was involved because uh, nobody ever found this money. So, Bugsy organized rackets and casinos in Hollywood, and he would. Uh, get a lot of his work done by rigging the studio unions, right? He would choose who the studio unions elected to be head of the actors union guild or whatever. And by all of his Hollywood machinations, he ended up with a 35 room mansion in Hollywood. Wow. Now Bugsy's chief skill was as a, uh, psychopathic organization, organizational manager. He was a solid corporate man, right? Like he was really good at organizing stuff. He had a lot of organizational skills. That actually comes out in the movie too, if you watch it. Uh, Warren Beatty actually does a pretty good job of coming off as a um, control freak psychopath, right? There's a funny scene where he makes one guy like get down on his knees and walk around and just oink like a pig. <laughs> He's like, oink, oink for me, oink. Uh, where do we get it? So post-World War II Vegas becomes Bugsy's obsession. And he decides that all that matters to him is building hotels and casinos in the desert. By 1947, however, um, he, as we said, he had lost so much money that he ends up uh, gunned down by a car hit. So the original drive-by. And this represented a period when Jewish and Italian uh, mafia were in league working together. Now, eventually, the, the Flamenco, ironically, ends up making billions of dollars. Right? If they had just waited a little longer, <laughs> uh, the Flamenco uh, definitely raked in uh, billions in a few decades. But Nobody really understood that Bugsy's idea was way ahead of time. So in, in, a, in a sense, he was very visionary. So even he didn't live, live on to see, you know, the wild profits from his foresight. Uh, eventually, the commission, that is the five families together and the bosses, declare Vegas to be an open city and that any crime family can move in and operate there in the 1940s. This allows uh, massive amounts of bucks, mega cheese, mega, uh, mega stacks, right? Flowing into Vegas. 
Now, Meyer Lansky had illegal clubs and uh, secret gambling all over the U.S. and had helped arrange all of this. However, My- uh, Meyer was just a junior partner. Uh, Meyer was a particularly adept finance wizard and had a very high IQ. However, he was never able to become a full-on made man, but only operated as a consultant because he was, of course, not Sicilian. Bugsy's death, however, were not good because it uh, attracted a huge amount of media attention. Um, But this had a a positive aspect to it, right? Because at the same time as people were looking at the mafia, the death of Bugsy is actually partly what made the Flamenco so popular. So people now were interested and fascinated. Ooh, this is the, you know, Bugsy's uh, casino. Let's go stay at the Flamenco. And because he had been killed, now it was this place to go, you know, hotspot, right? You know, like a mafia martyr or something. Now, another interesting point that uh, brings about the FBI, right? Now, we had seen some investigations and some uh, people in, you know, different cities trying to go after organized crime. But on a national level, the U.S. didn't have any crime-fighting apparatus to go after domestic criminal syndicates. So in the the 1940s, even, the FBI didn't have any expert on organized crime. And as we know, this partly related to the fact that J. Edgar Hoover was himself uh, apparently blackmailed too, right? And if you've seen Oliver Stone's JFK, I think everybody knows why. (laughs) They know that story. Uh, and Hoover himself was a pretty nefarious character because he would use the media and blackmail people in Hollywood as well. Uh, but in the 1930s, the FBI was focused on bank robbers and, uh, you know, like John Dillinger type killers, right? They weren't focused on organized crime. But uh, because Hoover was such a uh, ruthless character himself, Right, he was able to attain quite a bit of power, and he composed uh, lengthy dossiers and files on all kinds of people. He had these really weird, strict rules too, uh, like of dress codes, and like you, you, you couldn't have a mustache, you couldn't wear any other color but gray. Or I just saw these very bizarre, strict codes for his men. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys appreciate this. Right? We're trying to give an education here for those who don't know how America really works and how geopolitics really works. And uh, if you don't know, then please support this stream by subscribing in the link below. Hit that like and that share button. Getting college education for, for pennies on the dollar, baby. Come on now. If you don't... You know, contribute. I'm gonna have to come after you, right? I know everybody out there is not is not uh, throwing in a little bit of chump change. Maybe you uh, might have to come visit some of you people. Uh, you don't uh, you don't throw in your chump change. You might get a little bit of visit from me. Now, uh, during World War II period, as we said, the FBI wasn't able to spend a whole lot of time on organized crime because of the focus on spies. And then in the Cold War, the FBI had to expend a lot of manpower towards Soviet espionage. So um, this was putting a lot of strain on uh, law enforcement on the FBI national level. So the FBI couldn't use the term mafia for whatever reason, which this could relate to hoover's being blackmailed right so we know he's being blackmailed and this is probably why for so long hoover wouldn't allow any of the fbi guys to use the term quote mafia and would forbid them to investigate uh the cosa nostra right now this is where we get the famous statement from hoover uh saying there's no such thing as the cosa nostra which is completely preposterous um and the best thing I can think of to explain that was right to um, point out that he must have been blackmailed because at the same time as he was saying that, and by the way, he was blackmailing others. 
uh, he had made the FBI into his own private kingdom. Um, he, as we said, vetted every trainee in his very bizarre set of weird rules. Um, Hoover was a very weird person. Uh, he forbade colors. You could you could never wear certain colors like red, which is weird because the mafia wouldn't like to wear red. Um, at the same time, there was another figure who's lesser known by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics named Anslinger. Now, Anslinger said the opposite of what Hoover said. He said, in fact, no, their Costa Nostra did exist. They uh, controlled a extensive national racket. And uh, they needed to be busted up. And Anslinger was famous because he had no interest in the Constitution or civil rights he would practice uh, harsh interrogation techniques and would even use illegal wiretaps. He didn't care. So whatever got the job done, uh, Anslinger would do. Now, this was a strange situation because there was competition between Hoover and Anslinger. And Anslinger was become, Hoover was the media star. And yet Anslinger, who was making these narcotics busts and doing, you know, real work, uh, only had one-third the size of the operation that Hoover had. Uh, Anslinger made uh, pretty strong claims that it wasn't just Cosa Nostra, but in fact, multiple mafias, including the Tongs, the Irish gangsters, the Italians, and the Jewish mafia, were all working together, especially in the drug racket. So Anslinger argued that he had a special insight into this because his task force was... Um, focused on drugs. And so through the drug racket is how he figured out that all of these different mafia interests were working together. By the 1930s, Anslinger had uh, definitively decided that the Sicilian mafia controlled most of the gangs, if not all. And he said all of the uh, heads of the families and the real power elite at that time were Sicilian. Now, the strange part, which uh, does probably relate to the secret connections and deals that were made for wartime intelligence, right? This could explain why the government ignored all the way up into the 50s this point, right? Why didn't the U.S. government go after this coalition of the syndicates and the families from, from what, the 30s to the 50s? Well, because many of these mobsters were working uh, at a, quote, shadow level with OSS, with naval intelligence, military intelligence, uh, and eventually up into the 50s, the CIA. That does make sense, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, now, up into the 50s, the four original godfathers were still there. Joe Bonanno. Joe Profacci, Vincent Morgano, Gaetan, Gaetano, Tommy Gaiano. Uh, everybody was still comfortable, all secure, all hidden to the public, all hidden to the feds. And the only one at this point that was known was Frank Costello, the only known boss at this time of of all of these families was Frank Costello, boss of the Gambino syndicate. Now, uh, the Gambino syndicate alone was at this point, the most powerful. The Gambinos had, uh, 2000 made men underneath them as well, as well as 1000 other wannabes and soldiers. So this is a small army here of uh, thousands of people. And, uh, in total, there were 24 crime syndicate families throughout the nation. And atop this 24 is the five, right? And the five are the biggest. And in fact, the some of the more famous, right? The Chicago outfit of Al Capone and Sam Giancana. There was only 300 men in the Chicago outfit. So in, in actual manpower, uh, the Chicago outfit was not that powerful. Now, in the early days, as we said, with Tammany Hall, uh, 
corrupt politicians like Boss Tweed and William O'Dwyer, uh, they went pretty easy on the rackets because a lot of these men were bought off. Um, in the 1920s, somebody, I can't read my notes, somebody actually did start to go after the mafia, but I can't tell who, who that is. Um, but early on in that phase, nobody really got much done. And, and in the 20s, the, the, the five families weren't as powerful as they became by the uh, 40s and 50s. Um, the two biggest and most wealthy of the family heads were Joe Bonanno and Frank Costello. Both were equally wealthy and had many, many, many fronts. Right? Uh, Bonanno um, would actually train up-and-coming made men at his palatial estate. So if you got recruited, if you went up in the ranks, they say, all right, you need to go, uh, you know, to, <laughs> to mafia boot camp. And so you would fly up to Joe Bonanno's estate and you would learn the ropes. Right? Now this is actually because, you know, people don't think of organized crime operating in this, like educational way, <laughs> like, you know, that you're going to go study uh, to be a master criminal. But uh, nevertheless, that appears to be the way it works. And one of the famous characters who would go study under Joe Bonanno was the character Santo Traficante, right? And he would be the uh, mafia's arm in Florida. So he actually went and studied in the estate the secrets now, amongst the mafiosi, as we said, there was a uh, set of rules that related to procedure and policy and conduct throughout all of life. Right? So this is not just uh, conduct relating to business, but a lifestyle. And part of this code is uh, you cannot mess with any other made man's girlfriend or wife. Uh, you keep your gumars private. Don't let this get out. Uh, if you did, did mess with someone else's wife or daughter, you were castrated. So very strict <laughs> rules uh, as it pertained to this kind of stuff. Um, sometimes there were uh, situations of intermarriage. There was a uh, marriage uh, between two big families that was taken that took place at the Astor Hotel. And this is what you see uh, basically uh, imaged in the first Godfather. Remember the big wedding at the beginning of the Godfather? This is uh, hearkening to this famous wedding. I forget which families it was, but no, it's not. Maybe it is. I don't know. But um, two uh, things that were unique in this period that contributed to the down uh, the demise of the, the five families over time was the lavish living. So Joe Bonanno and Frank Costello lived so lavishly and had such, you know, big houses and whatnot that this again called a lot of attention. Um, but meetings in this period, thirties uh, and forties would be done at uh, Morgano's house, which is a, a horse farm out in the, countryside of New York. And this is when we get to the period of Estes Kefauver and um, Joe McCarthy also uh, beginning to go after both crime syndicates and communists. Right. So uh, McCarthy was involved in this crackdown as well. Now the figure of Estes Kefauver is important because he is a guy from Tennessee. Uh, he teams up with McCarthy and the idea originally is we're going to crack down on crime. Keith Alver goes first for gambling, and uh, this calls attention to the big city machine and racket, the elector, quote-unquote, machine, right, uh, which people were figuring out that <laughs> these a lot of these uh, inner city, big city, you know, Chicago, New York elections are not on the up and up. Uh, let's see. So the police of New York um, 
step in and say, yes, we're going to aid Estes Kefauver in his giving him intelligence on the crime syndicates. So again, now we're moving into this period where media attention is coming to the Cosa Nostra, to the five families. And this starts a, a series of hearings. And so Estes Kefauver goes on a, a 14 city wide tour doing hearings and he calls forth 600 witnesses uh, before his New York committee. Now, this is a big piece of the puzzle for the downfall because the three major networks televise these hearings on the mafia. This is the TV's first live spectacle of this kind of an event. And this had record viewership, 20 to 30 million viewers. Um, and this was the first time that we'd ever seen big heads of families appearing on TV. Uh, Frank Costello, as we said, uh, is the big, the big guy that would testify. He's the only one, the only boss that they were able to get on camera. But he would only testify if the uh, committee agreed to no filming. So I guess they had those goofy looking cartoon drawings, right? Like the leprechaun. <laughs> so they had, they had a sketch artist, I guess, put up a picture of uh, Frank Costello because he refused to be on camera when he testified. He also refused any real questions. And of course, when, oh, I only plead the fit. I plead the fit, right? Uh, at this point, the uh, committee determined that the mafia sold drugs they ran thoughts, uh, they ran casinos, and they had some other money rackets. But um, the problem was that they still could not get hard evidence on the Dons and the Mafia proper. Right, So they, they had some loose criminal connections here, some lower level people, but couldn't get hard evidence for the international racket. Um, they also failed as a committee to call any of the three big dons, right? They only got Frank Costello on. Um, and all they got Frank on was contempt of Congress. <laughs> so Frank Costello only goes to jail for 15 months and um, was able to successfully conceal his actual wealth, right? So uh, these guys were very adept at uh, the uh, practice of concealing and hiding money. However, uh, when Frank got out, Frank loved to spend money. And this would be, again, as we all know with Al Capone, right? This would be one of the key ways that the um, Dons would be prosecuted is tax evasion. So they went after Frank Costello next for tax evasion, but on that charge, he only got 11 months and then got off. <laughs> so uh, these smaller crimes are not really able to, uh, they're not really able to do much with what they're getting them on. And they're not really getting the racket, they're just getting one guy for 11 months. Right? So it's not doing much. Next, uh, Keith Albert decides he's going to have to go after Meyer Lansky. And so, um, Rather than the actual uh, prosecution of the mafia at this time, what is doing the most damage is actually the media attention, right? So the millions and millions of people being made aware of the operation is what in, is in time going to make it very difficult for the operations to continue. So even though they're not busting the mobsters, the media attention is going to make it very difficult. And especially as we get up into the modern period with John Gotti, that's going to be a really big area of mistake, right? So the Appalachia meeting and then John Gotti and uh, uh, Castellano and his lavish living are going to prove disastrous uh, for the mafia. Um, so Keith Albert says, all right, now i got to focus my attention on Meyer Lansky. I'm going to go after him. And so they bust a bunch of his uh, hidden secret casinos, right? And guess where Meyer was running a lot of his hidden casino operations? Broward County, Florida. <laughs> uh, and so that gets shut down. But really, the only damage done by all this is, again, just the media attention, not actual jail time. 
Also interesting, too, that uh, Meyer ended up dying in 1983, and he was never convicted of anything, right? So he might have had a few misdemeanors, but was never convicted of any actual serious crime. And uh, the irony here, too, is that Estes Kefauver never went after Hot Springs or any other rackets in the South. He only focused on these rackets. And by the way, as we saw with uh, the bootlegging hypocrisy, by the way, if you go watch Untouchables, but the, the movie is goofy. Okay, the, I didn't realize it was a goober movie. I thought Untouchables was going to be like Bugsy or you know Goodfellas, and it was like a bumbling, fumbling gaggle of clowns <laughs> like trying to take down <laughs> Al Capone. Right? Uh, they look like idiots if you go watch that movie. Uh, but just like right, the Sean Connery character, right. Or the Kevin Costner character, like they drink. <laughs> they're out there busting all the, they're busting all the bootleggers, and they drink. Well, guess what? Estes Kevalver was a gambler, <laughs> so he's busting the gambling rackets. But he liked to gamble. Um. Now he ends up running for some office. I forget what. Uh, vice president, president, or vice president. He, he's on some big ticket, but he ends up losing. Um. And he was going to go after the big city machine, the big city election machine. And this ended up just not working out. So Keith Albert calls a lot of attention, but doesn't get much done. That's his main um, focus and victory, I guess you could say, on the side of the government. 1951, uh, Vincent Morgano um, takes over, uh, or excuse me, um, Vincent Morgano disappears. Uh, so this is a speculated uh, event in the history of the five families. And uh, it would appear that some people think Albert Anastasia most likely had him killed. And Albert Anastasia took over his family. Yeah, so it, it would appear that Vi uh, Vincent uh, Morgano, Morgano was assassinated by Albert Anastasia of Murder, Inc. And this allows him to take over that family. Um but this is a problem because uh, this is an unsanctioned hit, right? You're not supposed to kill a Don or a made man without the approval of the majority of the family, right? The commission. However, uh, for a time, they decide to overlook this unsanctioned killing. Uh, Albert Anastasia then goes to, uh, on to build a New Jersey mansion, but he's so nervous uh, about himself being <laughs> retaliated on and hit and assassinated that he, uh, ha I was always seen with this retinue of, of bodyguards. Uh, and if I recall, um, isn't it a bodyguard that most likely kills him? Right. So if you got a whole bunch of bodyguards, you're not right. Uh, you're not impossible to get to because somebody's just got to pay off the bodyguard. Um, this is during the period when we saw uh, Tommy Lucchese and Lucky Luciano team up and control the clothing union racket uh, and the payday loans. They run the payday loan usury rackets and make a mint from loan sharking. Um, they also loved boxing, and this is important because uh, they would, as we said before, fix a lot of the fights. So here we begin to see, well, we'd already seen it actually, uh, was that Arnold Rothstein had fixed the 1919 World Series. Uh, and now we see a lot of boxing matches uh, also rumored to be fixed uh, throughout this period. And guess what? It's no different today, goofballs, that all you sports ball fanatics, people that worship sports ball, did you know that sports ball is still fixed? by the mafia and criminal syndicates. Duh. Frankie Carbo. Frankie Carbo is Tommy Lucchese's man, and he is a suspect in the uh, hit on Bugsy. Frankie Carbo was part of Murder, Inc., and uh, eventually gains the title Mr. Fury. So Mr. Fury and Mr. Gray were part of fixing the fights and the the rumor is that i think it was the marciano one of the rocky marciano fights right there's another rumor that uh they were trying to get sugar ray robinson to 
uh, fix his fight, but supposedly Sugar Ray Robinson told him no, although some people dispute that. And that they will say uh, sometimes when you notice people suddenly falling down in the fight when they weren't hit <laughs> or they weren't hit that hard, uh, this might suggest fights being fixed. How long have we been going here? This is important, too, to keep in mind the connection to, again, uh, sports is entertainment, right? Sports is part of the media entertainment Hollywood complex, you could say. You could say it's, kind of an, it's not Hollywood, but kind of an extension, right? Um, but just as with Hollywood, just as with the music industry, right, just as we saw with the jukebox racket, right, there's really no area of gambling, entertainment, boxing, sports, NBA, right? Jai Alai, that whole goofy sport, that's a mafia created sport. The whole sport's fake, right? The, you know, the guys that throw that ball with that stupid thing on their arm. <laughs> uh, the Jai, you go down to Florida, you see the Jai Alai, world complex uh, headquarters of Jai Alai. That was just a front for... Uh, for mob money and that actually comes up in black mass if you watch the johnny depp uh, black mass movie there's a scene where he goes down to florida to meet with the guy who runs jialai or however you pronounce it um and that's actually if you if you watch remember the beginning of miami vice miami vice begins with the jialai guys throwing the ball in the opening sequence of miami vice that was a uh, sports mafia front so, yeah, so, I mean, uh, you know, this has been going on for fixing of uh, races, right? This is uh, going on for a long time. Who doesn't know this, right? But at the same time, everybody still worships sports ball. Um, everyone was scared of Carbo uh, in the boxing and entertainment realm because... Carbo was a dangerous character, right? and if he told you to fall down in the third third round, you better do it. Uh, however, he eventually goes down in a big uh, bust in the 1950s for extortion. So he gets 25 years in prison. Uh, oh yeah, here's my other note. It was Sonny Liston. So the boxer Sonny Liston was controlled by Carbo, um, and there is speculation that when Muhammad Ali KOs him, this is because of the um, order given for him to fall <laughs> to by uh, Frankie Carbo. Uh, so next up in part two of the part two, this is part two for part two. We will get into the heroin trade, the drug networks, Santo Traficante, and the famous Appalachia meeting. And the Appalachia meeting will be one of the key events that's a disaster uh, for the five families and their eventual downfall. And then we'll get to JFK. Uh, and we'll also have some more information on Vito Genovese who, as we saw, worked with Naval Intelligence in the U.S. So hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed this next installment of the History of the Five Families. Um, we're about not halfway through the book yet. Uh, we're, we're about how far? Five chapters? And then we've also got three other books that we're going to analyze in Concord with this, right? This and Murder, Inc. and so forth. So maybe we can stretch this out to, I don't know, four or five lectures. Uh, we'll see, but uh, also JFK, right? So we're going to do Traficante, drugs, the Appalachia meeting, and the important connections again to JFK, which are trust. I mean, this is not even, this is not conspiracy books. This is mainline history showing us pretty clear indicators of what was going on with JFK, RFK, right? And um, those situations. And if you want to see, of course, the full lecture, be sure and subscribe to Jay's Analysis at the link below. We got our first super chat from Big Baller, Big Spender Mark, who sends $1. He says, there's no doubt that Greeks, Serbians, Romanians, Russians have ties to the mob. 
Right, but this lecture is on the U.S. mafia, right? I can't cover the entire world's mafia and the history of all criminal syndicates. So we have to pick something. So we picked the five families. Um, but yes, every culture, every nation has criminal syndicates and mafias. How many connections to the church do these people have? Well, there are many connections. In fact, we saw with uh, the mafia, uh, the Italian mafia, that the church would let them uh, kind of be the uh, local militia, you know, aid to keeping churches from being uh, broken into and robbed. Um, by the way, Jack Nicholson and Departed is an all-time cringe performance. Uh, it was, yeah, I mean, he's playing a version of Whitey Bulger. So I definitely think uh, Johnny Depp as Whitey Bulger was much better. So if you watch Black Mass, that's a better, much better adaptation of the Whitey Bulger situation. But yeah, of course, there's uh, mafia, Greek mafia, Serbian mafia, Romanian mafia, Russian mafia, of course. Stevie, uh, $3. This is for your lawn furniture fund. Thank you. Uh, if we just get uh, 10 more people donating $3, I can go get another lawn chair. Goomba, $10. Do you believe there's a significant ethnic or ideological change in the Western elite from honky, and I can say that because of me, right? Uh, Cecil Rhodes with anti-Euro global, or is this purely a pragmatic move? What's the ideological change? Um, I think that there's kind of shifting power dynamics uh at times and so the the present day power elite uh, definitely seem to have an international technocratic bent so um i don't think it's primarily uh the way that we think of crime syndicates 50 or 100 years ago but what we learned by studying criminal syndicates from 50 100 years ago is the typical patterns that we will see in any criminal syndicate whether they're micro scale or macro scale so that's again why we're doing this talk is to understand how the world really works and understand that a lot of the world not everything obviously the whole world is not criminals <laughs> obviously right that would be absurd but a big portion of the world's economy a big portion of the world's trade um is black markets is uh, illegal arms is human trafficking is uh, drug trade is all these different things and so we're doing this talk to understand how the world works but thank you for that goomba mustard tiger five ten bucks have a great uh, day jay thank you for all the work you do hey thank you for get a body tall city five dollars good stuff jay now go get a sh get your shine i don't know what a shine box is is that something mob related? I don't know. Are you talking about shoe shines? I don't know what that means. Um, anyway, so yeah, thank you guys. Hope you like this. Next up, as we said, is uh, more about Santos, Florida, heroin trade, Appalachia meeting, and more on Vito and JFK. And uh, yeah, subscribe at Jay's Analysis and. Tomorrow, that's why I post. I wanted to do this today, and we're gonna uh, do the movies with Jamie tomorrow, and then I guess the day after that, I'll probably start also the serial killer series. So that's gonna be fascinating too, and you'll see all these worlds tie in together. They're all directly related. So if you would please hit like and share. Uh, if you didn't see part one, go back and watch part one and subscribe to get part two. 